So roughly half of Australia do not feel wealthy whatsoever. And despite many people having aspirations and optimism about becoming wealthy, what uh, really is quite confronting is most people don't know the action steps. They don't know what asset classes to invest in and they're not used to actually investing and taking chances to get a result. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show is brought to you by Leaf Blower Central. Yes, the maniacs are out. They're out and about and it's raining. Can you believe it? The leaf blower is on. It's raining outside. I was just meditating to the rain. It was making my brain feel wonderful. And then just as I got into a deep state of happiness, the leaf blower starts. So I'm considering running for office to ban leaf blowers. Uh, Surely in this world, uh, we can invent a silent leaf blower. There has to be a way. Elon Musk, if by any chance you stumble across my podcast, please invent a silent leaf blower. You have brought rockets back from out of space You have put microchips in people's brains that they can now talk to computers. Can you silence the leaf blower? But hey, guys, I'm back. I'm back from uh, travels. I might uh, dig into my travels next week, but if you're watching on YouTube, which uh, I I think 27 people do, Uh, You might see my little Komodo dragon hat. Yes, I have been to the island of Komodo. I've seen the Komodo dragon, a snake with legs. And uh, I had a good time. I've grown a beard. I'm hairy. I am also hairy. Uh, So uh, that's my update. But hey, what are we doing today on the podcast? Well, we're going to dig into asset classes And is real estate even an asset class to help people grow wealth into the future? Let's have that conversation. I think it's a worthy conversation. There's other ways to make money out of of your money. Uh, And real estate's not the only vehicle. It's not the only sheriff in town. But is it a worthy sheriff? Let's uh, have that conversation. So welcome back, regulars. You know the drill. Play the program in double speed. Get your life back. So we need to make money. Let's face it, uh, we live in a country whereby our wage will not get us to the end game. For most people, the wage is not enough. You need a mixture of wage and wealth to get where you need to go. So investing at a core level, investment 101, let's say, is just really understanding your risk tolerance, understanding what types of investments are available and really the idea of building a diverse portfolio that grows for you from two theories, time and compounding results. That is investing. It's the act of committing money or capital in the endeavor of expecting a higher level of profit down the track. And so if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably an investor. And of course, we all need to tackle investing because it is going to play a part in our retirement. I mentioned that on a podcast I did four weeks ago around consumption smoothing. I don't think anyone listened to it. It fell off the rankings. It could have been the end of my podcast career, but it really... What it was about was the idea that we need to take money today and invest and double that money, duplicate that money so that we can pay for unexpected challenges through hopefully a very, very long life. And investing is really just understanding your risk tolerance. 
how you measure risks, what factors you determine to uh, indicate what risk is, the amount of money you're prepared to put into a market, the amount of money you're prepared to lose in a market, your time frame to create a result from an asset, and really your emotional ability to handle both risk and reward in the marketplace. And of course, for a lot of people, their emotional ability is very, very low when it comes to uh, getting out and doing something about real estate um, and investing in an asset class. There's some recent surveys and the average Australian feels about uh, 49% out of 100 of where they would like to be when it comes to to their wealth position. So roughly half of Australia do not feel wealthy whatsoever. And despite many people having aspirations and optimism about becoming wealthy, what uh, really is quite confronting is most people don't know the action steps they don't know what asset classes to invest in and they're not used to actually investing and taking chances to get a result. Their financial literacy is very low and as such, they just can't find a starting point with their relationship with the investment, their relationship with money and investment. And so not many people are actually equipped to invest. That's the the truth of the matter. And when it comes to a changing world of which we live in, we're living in a place of technological innovations, automation, blockchain check, quantum computing, really transforming industries. We also live in a time of demographic shifts. We've got an aging population around the world. We've got declining birth rates. We've got uh, migration patterns, which are always economically changing. And of course, we have climate change and sustainability challenges ahead, a, a transition to a green economy, which of course, again, makes investing sometimes feel very complicated. And of course, uh, we have monetary and financial innovations with things like cryptocurrencies and decentralized finance. And of course, uh, how that's managed and, and where that's available is different all the way across the world. And of course, we have urbanization, people moving to cities at a rapid rate, along with geopolitical shifts. And of course, health and biotech transformations, which is making people live a lot longer. And of course, for A lot of people, we now not only need to invest, but we need to reinvest in our education because skills are always changing. We are automating a lot of the workforce. Um, Education and roles are becoming uh, less, uh, some roles are becoming redundant, some roles there's a skill shortage. So we always need to be on our toes when it comes to what next when it comes to our world. And of course, uh, when it comes to energy, we're seeing a transformation in that space and really uh, almost a devaluing or debasement of currency, of cash. It's not worth as much as it used to be. And of course, this leads rise to the fact that right now, according to Prop Track, which... uh, It's a huge data uh, platform, um, realestate.com. Australia's affordability is at its all-time low. Like it has never been less affordable to buy real estate. And of course, that begs the question, is real estate a good asset class if people ultimately are struggling to afford it? And of course, if we look at the... uh, affordability metrics as measured by prop uh, track, um, the bottom 20th percentile of humans in Australia now cannot buy real estate. It's, it's effectively over for them. And the middle uh, 
marketplace now can ultimately only afford around, uh, uh, well, less than 20% of what real estate is available in the market. And so if you, the, your, your medium income earner, if you like, um, the real estate market is not matching their medium profile. So the median real estate price does not match the median wage. The median income um, only buys you around uh, sort of circa 17% of the marketplace is available to you. And of course, um, the highest income profile, um, the top 75% of households, um, well, they can now afford, based on their income alone, around 50% of the marketplace. So you can see you not only need income, you need wealth today. So you need a combination of the two to own the best assets in the real estate market. What does that ultimately mean? You take a wage, you take a big deposit, you take uh, equity from other assets, and you can ultimately guide yourself into a place where you own standout investment real estate. And of course, the real estate market is a trickle-down marketplace. The best real estate ultimately usually has a higher price tag already, and uh, the marketplace trickles down to find affordable options in the marketplace. But when it starts to run out, you start to also go into a place where you have to adjust the outcome for risk. And uh, I think I've done a recent podcast on risk-adjusted returns, the idea that you need to account for that if you're going to leave a superior location to an inferior location, that is an adjusted metric, a risk-adjusted metric. And I'm always a big advocate of finding the affordable yet highly livable areas to invest in because I think today, and hotspot's kind of a contentious word in investment real estate because there's a lot of faux pas fake hotspots what is not fake is where society wants to live, aggregate demand wants to live, then usually you can find some still affordable properties, but it is getting harder. Affordable properties which are highly livable, which make great property investments. So what should you invest in? And is real estate still worth it? when it comes to building wealth in Australia's economy? Well, for a start, we need to define what an economy is. And an economy is ultimately the, uh, the placement of or what society deems as scarce. And so in Australia, for example, we have a lot of iron ore. So to Australians, iron ore is not a scarce resource. However, if you come from another country and you need steel and you don't have iron ore, then all of a sudden that scarcity principle in your own country means you need to buy iron ore from Australians. Equally, Australians don't have cheap labor forces. We don't have uh, basically human beings that will work for nickels and dimes like many other emerging economies around the world. So we uh, ultimately have a scarcity of cheap labor. Other countries do not have a scarcity of cheap labor. And so what happens is you get things like our iron ore sent over to countries which have cheaper labor, which then produce steel and quite often manufacture things and we'll buy back our own iron ore through a manufactured item. And so all around the world, economics is effectively the uh, buying and selling of scarcity. And so it's an important principle to understand 
when it comes to judging assets, scarcity, scarcity. And of course, we know real estate is very, very scarce at the moment. It's not around. Just go to a rental open home and you'll see 45 people lining up to view an apartment. It's a scarce asset. I know it doesn't feel it sometimes, but it actually is. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So let's start with cash. Is cash a scarce asset? Well, actually, of course, cash is trash. And ultimately, cash is not a scarce asset whatsoever. And we have ultimately seen that cash can be printed by um, governments across the world. They, they can do what they want with their little printing press of cash. And uh, we obviously just lived through a period of quantitative easing where the reserve banks around the world just printed money, pumped the globe with cash. And of course, that has devalued cash. Today, uh, we now live in a society where your $100, my $100 doesn't go very far. Um, and of course, cash or the devaluing of the Australian dollar is a financial reality today. You are living through it. You are not uh, expecting it to arrive. This is not a theoretical conversation. You have seen the Australian dollar collapse against asset prices. And ultimately, what has unfolded is people with assets have got richer. And people without assets have got poorer. People with real estate have got richer. People with cash have got poorer. People with Bitcoin have got richer. People with cash have got poorer. People with stocks have got richer. People with cash have got poorer. The financial reality of cash is it is trash. Ch cash obviously has a utility. So you need some of it to buy stuff. But as a, uh, as a, Asset class, it is ultimately the worst you can ultimately hold because it has no scarcity value. Now, when it comes to choosing assets, we just want really, in my opinion, two principles, a utility, a use, and if it is scarce. Those are the two main drivers. And of course, uh, when it comes to an asset, if you can get a yield and capital growth, that is the complete package when it comes to an asset. So let's talk about equities, shares, the share market. It's the same thing. Sometimes people will say equity. Sometimes people will say stocks. Sometimes people will say shares. It's all the same thing. And of course, we as investors can buy stocks. We can buy companies. Now, companies issue stocks to raise money effectively, and they do that so that they ultimately don't have to equity finance. They don't have to borrow money. In other words, instead of borrowing money, paying interest, they will uh, sell stocks or um, stocks in their, in their companies and create shareholders. And um, stocks ultimately make money because companies are out to create a profit. And of course, a good company will create a profit and pay a dividend. Obviously, is a risk that a company will go bankrupt and be kicked off the stock exchange. There's obviously also no guarantee a company can pay a dividend if it's struggling to survive. And so with the stock market, there are generally um, stocks which are pretty safe bets when it comes to providing growth and the dividends. And of course, then there are more volatile stocks, which are uh, penny stocks, which are a bit more of a punt. And of course, you can get uh, stocks which are primary, which are basically uh, pre-IPO kind of stocks. So basically stocks before they go on to the stock market. And you can get secondary market stocks, which are 
basically stocks which people have traded already on the ASX 200, on uh, the um, New York Stock Exchange, whatever it may be. So stocks obviously are a good investment and a lot of people have made money out of the stock market and probably in particular based on some of the big tech stocks leading the way. But when we look at stocks, obviously they are a higher level of volatility, not as high as volatility as cash. Cash is trash. But ultimately, when it comes to scarcity, well, uh, stocks aren't really that scarce. They're bought and sold every day. Um, you know, obviously, the higher the price, the less potentially people um, look at those stocks as uh, readily available in the marketplace, but stocks are not scarce. New companies happen every day. And uh, the advantages, though, of the stock market is ultimately their companies provide a use to society, all right? All the goods and services we we buy and, and, and use are, uh, are companies. They're all created from companies. And so stocks provide a good tax hedge. They usually provide a dividend and they also provide a capital growth rate. The one thing about stocks, which is obviously less attractive than real estate, is leverage. The stock market has margin calls. And of course, a margin call is, is very, very simple. If you're Stock drops below a certain price of which you have borrowed money, you need to effectively top up the difference. In residential real estate, there is no margin call. In other words, if you bought a property for a million dollars and you borrowed 900,000 and put 100,000 of your own money in, but the real estate all of a sudden became 800,000 and uh, your effectively below the margin of what you borrowed, you don't get a call from the bank saying, can you please top up the other $100,000 immediately? Uh, you've got 24 hours to do that um, because real estate just doesn't carry that, that footprint, um, which is really, really, really handy with real estate, i.e., it's a slower beast, the real estate market. As for the stock market, it's fast. It's furious. Real estate is traded every single day, every single minute. Um, sorry, the stock market is traded every single day, every single minute. And of course, that creates a higher level of volatility. It's not uncommon for the stock market to change in price 5, 10, 20% every single day. And of course, uh, you can look at the bond market. Many people like bonds. It's a pretty, uh, pretty simple formula, the bond market, how it ultimately works. Let's say you bought a 10-year bond and it pays 2.5%. Two and two and uh, well, uh, and you paid, I don't know, $100 for the 10-year bond. Um, effectively, every year you're going to get 2.5% paid for your bond. It's very similar to, um, I guess, the bank rate, um, money in the bank. The only difference is it's fixed, so you typically can get a higher amount. Um, so if you put $100 down for 10 years, you're going to get $25 back. So your $100 plus $25. Now, Moody's ranks bonds. There's AAA ranked bonds. There's AA, single A, double B, triple B, triple C, and even junk bonds. And of course, uh, certain bonds can come from corporations, come from government, and they carry different risk profiles. Ultimately, uh, the highest quality bonds will pay the lowest dividend. The lowest quality bonds, junk bonds, will pay the highest dividend. And of course, for the most part, if you go through the AAA system, the bonds are very, very safe. If you go to junk bonds, they're more risky. And of course, uh, when it comes to scarcity, there's no 
Uh, there's no scarcity value in bonds. They're issued all the time. There's a new bond all the time. However, it does provide a dividend. It does provide a dividend. And for a lot of people uh, who've got wealth, they're just looking for income as a uh, as a annual thing and uh, tend to look at the bond market. So what about gold? Obviously, gold is uh, one of those asset classes which, again, um, is it a scarce asset? Are they creating more gold? Do they dig up more gold around the world? It's pretty expensive to find gold. Is there a limited supply of gold? Well, the one thing about gold is gold is really a secondary currency for countries. A lot of the world's gold is traded at a national level, i.e. the Russian government is stockpiling gold. The Indian government is stockpiling gold. The Australian government has gold. Uh, and so as a reserve of currencies, a lot of national governments buy gold. And so for um, for a safety factor, gold is very, very safe because it is really backed by government. And so uh, when it comes to its, uh, its growth formula, it's a very, very slow-growing asset class. And again, you can have some gold, and then you've got to work out, well, where do you keep the gold? Um, can you put gold under your back? Bed. Uh, there's obviously gold banks, but ultimately gold is very much an asset class that really underpins a lot of certain governments' behaviors. And so, again, it's a little bit of a hedge against the cash system as much as anything. I think for the most part, most people don't wake up every day going, I'm going to get wealthy out of holding gold. So one of the alternative versions of gold is the obviously cryptocurrency world. And uh, probably the most famous cryptocurrency is Bitcoin. And of course, Bitcoin carries with it scarcity. It has a scarcity value. Why? Because the algorithms of Bitcoin ultimately reduce the amount of Bitcoins put into the economy and eventually there is uh, Bitcoin ends. And those holding the Bitcoin, obviously, as long as it's considered a use, will um, have a solid asset. Uh, probably the one thing about Bitcoin which is probably less favorable than, for example, two very vanilla asset classes is yes, it's scarce, but it does carry volatility. Um, it doesn't necessarily have a dividend. It's really based on um, more people wanting to absorb the supply and obviously the diminishing supply pushing the value up. And ultimately, its volatility can move 40% in an afternoon. But equally, it is a scarce asset. And as society tends to morph into something a little bit faster, it is, uh, it is a currency. And so currency trading happens every day. Um, the Australian dollar is traded against the US greenback. The US greenback is traded against the, the, the yen, uh, the euro, and of course, Bitcoin is no different to any other currency other than the other currencies, obviously, are subject to cash of printing money. And of course, Bitcoin is the reverse version of that. One of the disadvantages, obviously, of the Bitcoin world is its use, its utility. Um, for the most part, you can't go and buy a coffee with Bitcoin. And so um, its utility is not as strong as, for example, a company that provides a use to consumers 
uh, on the stock market or real estate, which provides a use of housing, shelter, which is probably a reason why uh, real estate is quite a strong asset class. But if we look at probably the best performing asset class over the last decade, it's, it's Bitcoin for and high performing for people who have bought it at, you know, a thousand bucks a, a, a Bitcoin to 7,000 bucks a Bitcoin. And obviously some people bought it for a dollar and, and we've all seen them on TV. Wow, the Bitcoin billionaires that, uh, that uh, got, uh, well, you know, obviously had some foresight and got a bit lucky from the asset class itself. Will Warren Buffett's examination of Bitcoin come true, that it's a, a Ponzi scheme that uh, basically requires someone else to be a greater fool and come in and pay more for the Bitcoin? Um, I don't know the answer, but uh, certainly when it comes to how I value assets, I'm looking for a few fundamentals. I'm looking for capital preservation. I want to protect my money. I'm looking for growth. I'm looking for a dividend. I'm looking for tax advantages. And I'm looking for a use and scarcity. And real estate ultimately has the best use. It's obviously shelter. And it is very, very scarce. It's hard to replace. It's hard to build more buildings and create more real estate. It is a scarce asset on this planet in certain countries in certain places. And for that reason, I really love real estate into the future because I think real estate is even going to be harder to produce over the next decade. I think uh, the problem of producing more real estate is not, not going to go away. Um, I think that real estate itself has probably best look as a package of them all. If you think about capital growth, it can provide that. If you think about uh, rental returns as a dividend, it can provide that too. If you think about reducing your taxable income using real estate, it provides that today. If you think about capital preservation, companies can go broke, Cash can be devalued. We've seen that. We're living that right now. Um, obviously, crypto can go up and down like a yo-yo. Uh, for the most part, real estate doesn't have big mood swings. It, yes, it can go down in value 5 10% a year. Then it kind of, uh, that, that's not a big swing in, in, in preservation of, of, um, of the of assets. Could real estate go down by 50%? I don't think it can. I don't think it will. I mean, everyone would be buying it if it went down 50%, so it would ultimately find its way back up. But uh, certainly when it comes to its growth, it's got it. Its dividend, it's got it. Its tax advantage has got it. Its capital preservation, it's got it. Then two other things which I think is really, really critical to any asset class is scarcity. Real estate is scarce. It is hard to produce. It is hard to produce. And we see that today that there's ultimately not enough properties going around. And that's why you see 50 people lined up for a rental inspection. And probably the one thing which I love about property is its utility value. It has a use. We live in properties. And so unlike the share market where ultimately people, uh, you know, don't live in the share market. People don't live in the bond market. People don't live in the cash market. People don't live inside of crypto. Um, and for that reason, I think real estate is always going to be very, very popular. Do People need to work out how to today buy real estate from using a mixture of, uh, of cash or, or borrowings or leverage um, to get into real estate and their income. Yes, they do. Do people today need to use 
both their income and leverage from real estate and also wealth that they've accumulated potentially through the crypto market and the stock market to get into real estate, it's very, very plausible that today to buy the best assets, you need to put not only income, but some wealth to obtain some good real estate in the marketplace. Are there still entry-level properties that people can get into and make money out of real estate? There sure are, but it just takes a little bit of understanding of where to find them. It takes uh, a full-time person like myself and buyers agents, investment agents who find these places uh, because we do that full-time. So remember, good leverage in real estate. It's a hedge against inflation. It provides a dividend. It provides capital growth, provides a use, and ultimately it is scarce. That's why I think real estate will continue to do very well because when you actually compare it to other asset classes, it comes number one. It is the number one asset class in my viewpoint. And if you just work out how you're measuring that, I think you'll find that the returns on real estate are as good as any other asset class, less the volatility. All right, folks, I'll talk to you soon. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.